thank you for allowing me to be here and visit with you today. Yes, I'm thrilled you're here. Personally, I always want to learn more about actors and directors and producers and their backgrounds and how you got to where you are today and how we can support you. And I'd like to talk about the backstage experience too and learn about your process. So I'm looking forward to learning from you today. Great. So what was your first taste of creativity? It was my kindergarten year. I remember playing the role of Jesus, though I can't remember the play. I do remember clearly that my parents were in the audience, and that's where I caught the theater bug. During high school, I was fortunate to gain theater experience by being involved in the Deaf Youth Drama Program, DYDP, under the auspices of Seattle Children's Theater in Seattle. They had a residency program that went to different mainstream schools. My school was one of them. I got involved my senior year. Billy Sego ran the program along with Howie Sego. That gave me a good introduction to the theater world and really sparked my creativity in the field of theater. I learned things like improvisation, basic translation skills, how to work with other students. We all came from quite different backgrounds. We were all deaf, we all signed, but we were all from a variety of backgrounds. It was nice to see how we were able to meet each other halfway and interact. In a nutshell, that's where I got my theatrical experience at the time. Yeah, and clearly all of that has influenced your life for sure. So DYDP, is that a year-round program or summertime only? My understanding is that we had two? It was year-round. Well, fall to spring. They followed the school year. They also had a summer program. The artists would take on students that were interested in continuing with theater. I was one of them. We went to Seattle Children's Theater and put on a main stage production with a bona fide audience. Yeah, and since you just talked about your first acting role, we'll skip that and jump to the next question. I read that you worked with NTD. How did that happen? You went from college or, well, senior year of high school and then... That's an interesting story that goes back to DYDP again. As I mentioned, I was in DYDP's production. I graduated high school and went to National Technical Institute for the Deaf, Rochester Institute of Technology. Interestingly, I never involved myself in the drama program there. Five years later, I moved back to Seattle and I happened to get in touch with Billy he was still running DYDP at the time. I asked him what opportunities he had for someone over 21 like me. He suggested I applied for NTD's summer school program. I looked into it and went. It was a two-week professional acting program. After that experience, I auditioned for their next season's production and landed a role. Six months later, I came back to Seattle. I'd gone down and visited people in LA from time to time. I then decided to apply for NTD's summer school program all over again. It was then they offered me the opportunity to audition for Deaf West's production of Big River. I got that role. And the rest, as they say, is history. Cool. So... Who was teaching at NTD at that time? I know you had a two-week program. Do you remember who all your teachers were? Well, Bernard Bragg, Rita Corey, uh, Peter Cook, to name a few. There were a number of talented deaf people there at that time. Some had been in the business a long time. I learned things then that formed who I became as a theater professional. 
I will say, too, that it was nice while on tour to meet many deaf and hearing kids for whom there were too few deaf role models. Not to mention the deaf culture and linguistic role model I was to hearing people in general. I saw that as my responsibility representing NTED and enjoyed it. It's amazing that you had the opportunity to go to so many different summer programs. And I wonder if these days, are there enough opportunities for deaf actors to get their foot in the door and develop skills right now? I speak for others when I say deaf talent want to be afforded the luxury of diving into the art and not concern ourselves with the business side of things, like looking for funding. By diving into the art, I mean to immerse in the creative process. I'll leave it at that. So you've worked with both hearing and deaf theater companies. Have you noticed a difference? I would say the big difference is a hearing theater company is concerned with the auditory component of the production, whereas a deaf theater company is focused on what you can see. When I work with a deaf production, deaf cast, deaf director, we prioritize the visual. Of course, there are considerations to make the production accessible for hearing people who do not sign, voice interpreters and our captions. I've also seen time and time again the trepidation hearing people tend to have toward hiring deaf talent at the creative yes, level. Yes, I agree. Yep. I was planning on asking that. It happens all too often, and we need more deaf talent. Secondly, the vast majority of plays written do not contain deaf characters. Historically, playwrights do not think to include us. I think that's based on their experience, their their own culture, their own journey. The only way to write this is to have more deaf talent writing plays. That's one of the things that excites me about you, Patty. Selected as the playwright convening director, the more deaf playwrights there are writing characters like them, the more opportunities will be availed to us. Well, I look forward to seeing more deaf talent come on the scene everywhere. And I will shout out to Deaf Spotlight. Oh. You are doing a wonderful job hiring deaf talent at that creative level. I thank you for the opportunity. Always. But you are the experts. I'm just there to make the team happen and let you all go with it. I will say you have made some noise in Seattle's theater community, that's for sure. As a result, we have garnered recognition. Seattle's theater community now looks for ways to hire deaf talent. The past 10 years have been amazing for that. Yeah, well, I look forward to more. So you've had a successful career as an actor, and how did you then get into directing? What made you decide you wanted to try your hand at directing? One thing I forgot to mention, I did a two-year stint with DYDP. Big River had closed, and Billy reached out and offered me a position as his assistant. That was an opportunity I jumped at. I wanted to give back to the deaf community through the children in DYDP. Having had the experience in my journey as a deaf professional, I could give back by way of directing. I knew that by directing their productions, I could impart tools to the kids to ensure the show is a success and enjoyable for the audience. My point being, it was not only about pulling off wonderful work by deaf children, but also the whole thing I learned through my professional journey as a deaf actor turned director is I can teach how to connect to humanity in a variety of ways. In the end, we all have a greater understanding for each other, are able to work together, collaborate better, Theater is a great place for that type of growth. 
Yeah. And thank you for sharing that. I didn't realize you directed later and then came back to be Billy's assistant. Yeah. What a rich experience to work with Billy. I mean, Billy Seiko has a wealth of experience. After working with DYDP, I forgot, I worked with ADWAS, the Abused Deaf Woman's Advocacy Services in Seattle. I worked for their program called SAAM, Sexual Assault Awareness Month. They had an annual production associated with the month, two of which I directed. After that, I worked with you, Deaf Spotlight, directing two productions. There you have it, my full breath of directing so far. I think it's not often, well, I think it's cool because when you're an actor and you become a director, you can use your acting experience while directing to support the actors when giving them feedback and notes, because sometimes somebody might go straight into directing and not truly understand the actor's experience. I fully agree. To be a good director, you need to have acted. The prerequisite for any professional career is training that correlates with that field. And directing is no different. Acting is the prerequisite to know what to look for in a production. That said, there are a number of other balls in the air that need attention when directing. A good director knows how to work with actors, knows how to provide tools for character development, knows how to use space on the stage to make that scene work, and knows how to make the actions believable and authentic. All of this comes from having had acting experience. It really comes down to working with the actors to get inside their head to know their strengths and their weaknesses, so you could leverage their strengths to overcome weaknesses and bring their character to life. What's your favorite part of the directing process? My favorite part of the directing process, yeah. I'd have to say, is the auditions. Yeah? It's the one place I can freely experiment. I can throw out unexpected ideas for a deaf person auditioning. Here, here's an example. One person came in and they did their prepared monologue. Upon completion, I asked them to do it all over again, but with a different set of motivations, different intent in mind. That was not at all what they had expected or prepared for. And that was my goal. Right. I wanted to see how far they could stretch. Sure enough, they impressed me. So I threw out another intent and they ran with it. That's how to suss out real talent. Yeah, I think... Right. I agree. It's important to be prepared. And of course, do your homework before you audition. Always. Yes. You always do your homework before an audition. Like, don't just show up expecting to wing it. That brings to mind Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream. I'd never acted in a Shakespeare play before. This was to be my first. Howie Sego and Teresa Thuman co-directed it really had to do my homework. The character I was to play, Nick Bottom, is a universally known rite of passage rule throughout theater's long history. So many well-known actors have played Bottom. It's one of those dream roles. I wanted to eat, live, and breathe that role, which required a lot of research and analysis I had to figure out Nick's moment-by-moment -moment motivation for what he does in the story, which required a lot of self-reflection in order to best deliver the rendition I possibly could. I want to call out that year was an astounding year for Seattle's deaf theatrical community. I was nominated for a Gregory Award Josh Castile won the Gregory Award for his role as Hunchback. 
in the play Hunchback of Notre Dame. As well as both Billy and Howie Sego were recognized for their contributions to the theater community over the years. 2018 was the year of deaf talent in Seattle. <laughs> yes. Okay, so jumping to the next question, you've worked with several deaf theaters. How important is it to continue to work with deaf theaters? First, let me say the opportunities for deaf talent are few and far between. We need a greater number of deaf theater companies and or deaf productions able to showcase the capabilities of deaf talent. The more exposure to deaf talent, the more opportunities, the more deaf actors find themselves in plays and musicals. Thank you. That actually reminds me. Can you tell us what a DASL is and why it's important that we continue to hire that type of specialist in theater? Yeah. Director of Artistic Sign Language, DASL, is a role originated originally termed a deaf sign coach or an ASL expert. The emphasis on, is on translating English text to ASL. Those of us hired as sign coaches or ASL experts typically work with the interpreters and or the theater, be it a hearing or deaf theater, to focus on the translation process. DASL is a role that has come about, I'd say in the past 10 years or so. The scope is much more like a dramaturg for all things deaf and sign related. The onus is on the person to do vast research of the play content. The DASL will determine appropriate match of language given the era in which the play was set as the sign for something long ago might have evolved. The DASL will also work alongside the director ensuring the action on stage is accessible to deaf eyes in the audience. In short, beyond linguistic translations, the DASL will look at a variety of other things. As an example, I worked with ACT, a contemporary theater, ACT, in Seattle, one of the larger theaters there, on a production of Tribe. As an aside, that was the first production in Seattle in which Josh Castile appeared. As the DASL, I did do translation work for the deaf hearing mixed cast, but I also kept an eye on a number of other components. The stage was set in the round, so there is an audience all around the stage. I worked with the blocking of the action to make sure deaf characters signing is in a sight line to the deaf audience members. I also designated the best place to sell tickets to deaf audience members and educated the administration as to why their seats are optimal. I did a lot of logistic coordination to make sure the experience is 100% accessible for not only deaf but deaf blind audience members as well. For deaf blind people who have some vision, I had to make sure they were not only captions, but captions displayed in a way they could see them. For deaf blind audience members who are fully blind, we hired additional tactile interpreters and made sure they were seated appropriately. The overarching goal is to create a deaf friendly experience. from the person selling the tickets, to the lobby, to the show itself. Oh yeah, yeah, and I'd like to add to that. So you may not know that Ryan worked on the production Hunchback of Notre Dame with Josh Castile and EJ Cardona. 
on both the production side for the creative stage direction and also with the sign master, Ellie Savage, for the interpreters for the audience. How did that experience work out? I was the person who requested that. (laughs) The reason is more often than not, the theater will hire only one DASL. When the Fifth Avenue Theater wanted to hire me as the DASL for the musical, I knew it was going to be a ton of work, given the music, the dialogue, the ASL, not to mention the size of the cast. I knew I'd be stretched too thin to be able to work with the interpreting team on top of everything else. The musical is not all in sign. Though I did push and more signing was added later. (laughs) You pick your battles and some I won. Those times when no one is signing on stage, the audience could look to an interpreter and see the dialogue to ensure full access. Given all of that, I asked for a second DASL, Ellie Savage, to work with the interpreting team so I could put my energy toward the production itself. That made things possible. The needs of the interpreting team is quite different from everything else. The division of duties allowed me to focus on the production. And that allowed for this to be a success. We had differing roles, differing focuses, and differing priorities. The fact that the Fifth Avenue Theater got on board made the production a huge success. I would still think of us both as DASLs, but Ellie was more of a sign coach and I more of a dramaturg role. She and I worked closely together throughout to make sure the interpreting team had what they needed to be successful. It was a real collaborative effort. Right. I have to hand it to the Fifth Avenue for providing eight interpreted performances of that production, which meant that deaf audiences could show up at any time rather than at one designated show. That was great. Kudos to them for that. Having had experienced Oliver, Big River, and Hunchback of Notre Dame, all musicals, They tend to have a slew of things going on all at the same time on stage. Be it sign language or dialogue or singing or dancing, there's a lot going on and the audience needs to know where to look when. When there is a moment of focus called for. Anytime there's signing happening, the focus has to be on that person or deaf audience members miss out. It is imperative to create that moment of focus by working with the director to explain the why behind the focus. Remember, the director wants it to all sound and look like a cohesively beautiful marvel. But if the focus is lost, so too is the meaning and therefore the whole story. Working with a director that gets that is beyond appreciated. Add that to the list of jobs of a DASL. As you know, right now, COVID-19 is impacting everyone everywhere, especially the arts. Many theater companies and performing arts organizations have closed, and many people have been laid off. How can we support the arts and artists like you? That's a tough question. It's unfortunate we have to navigate this difficult time, yet the question is an important one. What I'm seeing, at least in Deaf Broadway, is an ask for monetary donations to allocate to Deaf talent associated with that project. And while that's a great approach, it's not enough. There's an actor's fund to assist deaf talent, 
But again, it's not enough. With this new kind of normal, this new way of living, we have to tap into our network to try to find fundraising and support deaf talent. Just an idea, but if we had a foundation or some kind of fund that was established that people could donate to and deaf talent could tap into when experiencing catastrophic situations, that might help. I know Actors' Equity has such a fun. Why not do something similar for deaf talent? The question becomes, who will take on that charge? Who will navigate the legalities, search for funding? That's a whole different skill set. But if a necessity, I don't see why not. Brilliant idea. Yep. Do you have any other new projects other than the one you mentioned earlier? Is that it? No, just that one in Seattle okay, is my current checking. project. If that doesn't work, I'll make it happen somehow. Great. And I have no doubt. I look forward to supporting your project. Thank you. <laughs> so that concludes the interview. And at this point, we tend to wrap up these interviews with a few final fun questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. What's your favorite sign? That. Okay. Least favorite? Put off. What's your deaf bing? Hmm. My deaf bing. Um, can we come back to that? It, it's all right. You can think about it. What talent would you like to have that you don't already possess? Investment banker. What word or emotion would you want people to remember you by? Bold. A bold attitude is essential when faced with adversity. Especially as a deaf person. I get that. Okay, circling back to deaf Bing, anything coming to mind? I'm guilty of using my voice. I'll yell at hearing kids to get their attention when I could just tap them for it. What can I say? Well, thank you so much for joining us. I look forward to following your journey as you continue with each of your roles in the theater world. Thank you again. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure, and I look forward to working together again in the near future. Yes, definitely. Bye-bye. <laughs>